Copyright University of Auckland, all rights reserved. The content and delivery of lectures in this course are protected by copyright. Material belonging to others may have been used in these lectures and copied by and solely for the educational purposes of the university under licence. You may record the lectures for the purposes of private study or research, but you may not sell, alter or further reproduce or distribute any part of these lectures to any other person. Failure to comply with the terms of this warning may expose you to legal action for copyright infringement by the copyright owner and or disciplinary action by the university. Hello, welcome, Dr. Susan Young from the United Kingdom. Okay. But just make sure I've got this on. Is that going to be okay? That sound about the right loudness. Are you, it's okay? Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed, Trevor and Helen, for organizing this occasion. I'm very pleased to be here and very pleased to have this opportunity to talk with you. Um, the topic, obviously, is... Oh, first of all, I just have to acknowledge some of my colleagues who will appear in the video clips um, that, that you'll show, that you'll see as I go through the presentation. Um, in this talk, I'm going to be uh, covering mostly playing with music, um, songs and voices, instruments and bodies. And then I do want to go on and just talk a bit, little bit about future musical childhoods, what I consider to be current and pressing issues for early childhood music education. I would say that the, the work and research and work with practitioners that I've done in the topic of playing with music is, has been uh, from about say 1993 to 2003, 2006. And the last uh, eight or nine, 10 years, I've been much more thinking about this idea of future musical childhoods, about musical childhoods in general. Um, one thing I, I also want to say before I really get going is that I don't know the New Zealand context for early childhood music education or for early childhood education at all. So I'm, all my work is within the context of the UK and you need to make those translations. So I, I'm not going to even try. It would be pretentious of me to try to make any of those kinds of translations. In fact, in the UK, we tend to look up to New Zealand early childhood education in general. Um, we consider it to be a very enlightened and innovative approach to early childhood. So um, you know, it worries me a little bit that some of what I say may be very familiar to you because we've always felt that New Zealand leads the way in early childhood music, or early childhood education in general, I should say. So these are the questions that I raise. These are the questions that I should be covering. What is musical play? Um, how does it sound and what does it look like? And one of the important things is that the research traditions in understanding children's musical play are not very long and not very extensive. So whereas we have a long, long tradition of studying children's art, children's uh, work with paper and pens and so on, um, and that's really deeply woven into early childhood practice, there isn't the same tradition of studying children's own made music. There isn't that same tradition of understanding what it sounds like and understanding what's going on when children make their own music. So it's, it's all a fairly recent uh, area of research and understanding. And at the same time, it's important to understand why it's valuable um, and what do children gain from it, therefore. And also, of course, in relation to our own practice in early childhood settings, what does the adult have to do? What's the adult role? How does the adult behave when children are playing musically? So the first area, as I said, I will talk about is um, children playing with song. And Alison, as you will see, just in this picture, I'll just go quickly, is sitting in a little den that she makes um, with a kind of draped fabric and boxes and blocks. So she made this little kind of tent, a singing tent. And she's sitting in there with a the guitar. In fact, when I listen to the tape, I think it's a ukulele that she's got. Um, and she's got a little tiny handheld digital voice recorder. So she's sitting in the singing tent or singing den, and Alison happened to be very interested in dens as a way of uh, encouraging singing play, encouraging uh, music play. And she was one of part of a free choice activity. So the time when there's free play, when the children can go around 
the different types of free choice activity, um, she's there. And she was in the middle of the nursery. She's in the middle of the nursery. Now, I'd like you to think about what you usually place where in your nursery setups. What usually comes in the middle on the tables? Now, I'm talking about UK settings. If it was a UK setting, what would come in the middle on the tables might be um, kind of some sort of pencil and paper activity, something perhaps to do with number. And I'm thinking three, four-year-olds here. So the kind of the serious things. And as you go further out, what comes next? Maybe the you know, dough construction kinds of things. As you go further out, you go outside, you get kind of free play, bodily activity, dance, and so on. Um, but where is the music on that kind of expanding uh, provision, nature provision? So it's very rare that a music activity might come in on a table in the middle of the provision. Very often we betray by where we place things and whether they're in the center and on a table, betray the kinds of values that we give to different kinds of activities in the early childhood setting. So that's one thing you might think about straight away. How do you position things? And and do you accord them different value as to how, where you put them? <coughs> so, John, okay. So, did you kind of pick out little bits of song there? And one, two, three, four, five, you know, once I caught a fish alive. And the, there's thunder bitches falling down. But not quite. And then it sort of goes into something else. So, little bits and pieces that she does. So, what's she doing? What's she able to do? What's she able to show us that she can do in that? So that kind of singing where children mix up little bits of song and take little bits of words and little bits of tune and so on and mix them up, that's often called a, a potpourri song, a kind of mixed up song. And that you'll hear very commonly done by, by children. I mean, she knows how songs go. She knows that it has to have a definite ending that slows and drops in pitch. So she sings it for a certain period of time and it has some phrases. And then she kind of knows it's about time that the song finishes. So she gives it a definite ending that slows down, and then it drops in pitch at the end. She does it a second time to sort of make sure it really does end, <coughs> definitely. And that also is a very common pattern. Coral Davis found that when in her research on children's spontaneous singing, that that's a very common pattern, way that children mark the end of a song, both to slow down but to drop in pitch. So she knows what her singing voice is, and that in itself is something that children need to learn. They need to learn how to manage their voice, how to manage words and melody, and how to make her voice change pitch. She can do that really very competently. Notice that she, it's very repetitive. I don't know what the word is that she uses at first, but it's the same word that comes over and over again. And then when she gets into one, two, three, four, five, which she's very comfortable with. She repeats that several times. So she wants the words to be very easy. She wants the words to be very easy and very repetitive. And notice that she sings in a fairly limited pitch range. And with a quiet tone, with short phrases, quite, quite a slow pace, and that there are gaps between the phrases. So this importantly, the way that she sings when she can completely control it for herself, shows us how children sing when they're left to their own devices, and, but also gives us indicators as to how when we, as adults, sing and lead the singing with children, the things that are important. Repetitive, easy words. Now, I wonder how many songs, certainly in the UK, Often the songs that are chosen for young children to sing have too complicated words. Or rather, in trying to get their heads around the words, they can't also manage the tune. So are the words simple? Is the pitch fairly limited? Are the children allowed to sing at quite a quiet tone? Because they've only got small lungs and small uh, capacity, and it's that which controls the kind of volume at which they sing. So don't be concerned if it sounds very quiet and slightly breathy. That's good singing for little children. Don't ask them to sing up louder. Um, and then, um, and if possible, withdraw your own voice so that you can let them sing quietly. And then this thing of short phrases, very slow, don't go too fast. Keep it very slow and leave these kinds of gaps where they can breathe and think. So she's showing us 
in her spontaneous singing, the best way to sing to, to, to uh, lead songs as well. So what did, what's Alison's part in that? What did she do? So she provided an environment. In fact, she was very interested in this whole idea of dens um, and that they, how they can help with a sort of focus. You can get inside the den. There's something really nice. I mean, children love it, don't they? Getting inside a little tent. Um, dens help with focus, uh, particularly in an early childhood setting when there's, an, as you can see, there's often a lot, you know, there's a lot going on and that children often find it hard to focus individually. She found they help with listening and reduce distraction. Uh, another way to engender for spontaneous singing is to have role play or to have props and so on. So there's lots of ways of doing it, but Alison was interested in dens and how they might be a particular way of engendering um, spontaneous singing. And so there's the adult, there's Alison there, ready for a song. And I don't know if you noticed it, but she sort of said she referred to your song, meaning her song. So she's there, she's interested, and she listens to it. And if, if you're listened to, something seems very much more important and valuable if it's listened to seriously. If somebody really hears what you're doing, it makes it seem much more valuable and much more important. So Alison is there, she's ready and interested, and she supports. She's also got this little recorder thing that she, um, re so that she can, sorry, the flash distracted me for a moment, um, so that she can record and then re the children can replay and listen uh, to their own singing. And that's a really valuable and important thing to do. There's all sorts of little tiny handheld little devices there are little things that children can have. I've had some um, little things that could, they can have around their necks that are the tin lids that blind people can use, seeing sight impaired people, excuse me, sight impaired people can use to put on tins to tell them what's in the tin and they'll record a very brief amount and the children can wear them around their necks and just record instantly something that they're singing and then replay it because uh, being able to hear what you've done is really valuable. The, the trouble we have with music, isn't it, is that it's invisible, isn't it? It's really hard stuff to work with, with children, because it's invisible and it, it disappears. It goes up to the ether layer somewhere. Uh, whereas when we work with children with, say, visual arts or with making models or in the sand or with clay or something, there's something fix that, that stays and that you can then talk to them about. You can then get hold of it and say something about what they've done. But you can't do that with spontaneous music in the same way because it's gone. Whereas with instant record and replay devices, you have that capacity now to hold on to what they're doing. Just an iPhone um, to hold on to what they're doing and then let them replay it. And Alison was sending these little songs that the children sang as an email attachment to the parents, involving the parents in Importantly, the children's improvised singing was expected. I mean, there was no, uh, you know, there was an understanding that the children would and will sing, and um, it was planned for it, supported and valued. So the valuable, the value of musical play, the value of that kind of singing, the children can find their own individual musicality and extend it. They can be musically creative, they can practice musical skills at their own pace and at their own level of challenge. And so they have a feeling that they're competent. They're not, I mean, that's the, the whole benefit of play, isn't it? That children can feel a, a level of competence and they set their own challenges, they set their own pace. And play is motiva motiv sorry, motivating and meaningful and it provides children with a deep level learning and a sense of well-being. Usually, that is. Usually. Let's not forget that play is not always valuable. We shouldn't romanticize play and think that it's always just because children are playing, just because children are um, making spontaneous music or doing some kind of play, that it's always valuable just because it's play. It can remain at a very low level and it can remain rather repetitive. And, and it can also perpetuate inequalities and stereotypes. You know, the boys who always play with one type of activity and the girls who always, they can be gender 
divisions in gender inequalities and, and stereotypes along other fault lines of difference. Uh, some children may lack experience as players. They may not have had very much freedom to play. And they may be inhibited, thinking about singing in particular, they may have been always told to keep quiet, to inhibit their voices. I mean, there's a lot of, of restrictions placed on children in, in making a noise and using their voices freely. So they may have had those kinds of inhibitions placed on them. And so they're not very used to playing. Um, and, they, and the kind of freedom that they're given or expected of them might create certain kinds of anxieties. Um, so this all points to the fact that the role of the adult is really, really important in structuring, steering, engendering good quality play. I mean, you know that that's why you're only as practitioners, but it's still important to think about it in terms of music. So what is needed in practice? So what as an early childhood practitioner do you need in order to be able to support uh, good quality musical play? Uh, first of all is, is the belief and conviction in the value of musical play. And that sounds easy to say, it's easy to put up on a PowerPoint, but it's much, much harder to uh, acquire and it's much, much harder to um, engender in, in all your practitioners, in all the practitioners in the setting. Um, and the knowledge that accompanies that is the knowledge of how children play musically and also pedagogical expertise and musical expertise to support, extend and build progress. So there's knowledge, expertise and beliefs. Those three areas of teacher development which uh, we all understand. So belief and value, first of all, beliefs and values. Um, so you need to firmly believe that learning in music is essential and possible for all children. And that can be difficult in an educational climate. Certainly in the UK, we have an educational climate that's gone right over to the core skills of literacy and, and numeracy, even, and that's permeated right down into early childhood. So an educational climate that emphasizes utilitarian core skills and devalues the arts. So it can be difficult to hold on to that belief to give music the kind of priority that it deserves and requires. It can also be difficult in a musical culture, Western musical culture that is, that believes that musical ability is only in the genes. That music is only something you can really do if you've been born musical, if you're gifted musically. If you can't do it, well then, you just can't. It's not, there's not a strong belief that music is something that you learn and everybody can learn it. There's the idea that you can sing or you can't sing. Not the idea that you need to learn to sing, everybody needs to learn to sing, and that children should be taught to sing, just as they're taught to read, just as they're taught to count, just as they're taught to do other things. And that it's not that some children can sing and some children can't, it's that they haven't been taught well enough or they haven't been given the opportunities to learn. I think the idea that musical ability is only in the genes is one of the reasons why uh, music tends to remain a, a kind of peripheral, a sort of frill, a kind of educational um, fun activity. It's okay as long as it's fun. Um, and, and that is because if you can only really learn music properly, if you're gifted, then for everybody else, music just needs to remain a fun activity because they can't really seriously learn it and, and achieve. So you can see you get this paradox. So the important thing is to recognize that everybody can learn the music. Everybody has the right and ought to be taught uh, to do music, to sing, or whatever it is. Um, and that's a really important set of beliefs and values that needs to be shifted. And in changing practice, always the, the important area to work on first is beliefs and values. When we have training days in, in early childhood music education, people always come and want activities. They want new ideas, they want songs and things to do. But actually, you do a much, much better job if you had a reflective discussion about beliefs and values in music. Because nothing will change until those change. 
You can have all the wonderful bag bag of activities in the world, but nothing will change in practice unless those beliefs and values at core have really shifted. And lastly, uh, in beliefs and values, it's very difficult to have those convictions in the UK with an early years curriculum that has low expectations and, and minimal guidance. In the UK, we have a curriculum which just says, kind of sing some songs. Wow, what songs? How many songs? Um, and uh, very minimal guidance about what. So I, again, this is where I can't comment on your TAFE curriculum, and you need to make those translations for yourself. So knowledge. So what is also needed is, is a knowledge of how children make up songs for themselves. The, uh, an understanding. We do know quite a bit. There isn't a huge amount of research, but there's some research. Uh, and Bronya is the expert on children's, the research into children's spontaneous singing. She's looked at all the prior studies. Um, but there are different types of singing that children tend to typically do. And these are generalizations, of course, and children will do different things. And children with different kinds of cultural backgrounds will do different kinds of things. But in general, uh, children will rework known songs. So they'll reproduce songs they know. Those are the kinds of potpourri songs. But they'll reproduce songs uh, in, in different kinds of ways, but rework them on their own terms and sing them in their own way. Um, of course, that requires them to have a rich repertoire of songs on which they can draw. So they do need to learn songs in order to have something to draw on in being creative with songs. So they need to learn lots of songs. Um, the kind of free flow singing is a different kind of singing. So it's when they're playing with something. They're playing with sitting on the floor, and you'll hear kind of la 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 kind of just little sort of aimless. And they usually focus, they, they're quite often on their own, and they're just sitting with something quietly doing it. And if you're going into, if you're in, in work tomorrow with small children, try and listen out for these things. Um, because one of the things uh, I have found, I did a, I've done various research projects in, in nursery settings. One of the things I've found is that practitioners don't hear the singing that's going on amongst the children. Or if they hear it, they don't think it's very important, so they don't take any notice of it. So I challenge you tomorrow when you go back, uh, see if you hear some, some singing amongst the children. So free flow singing is one of the things you can hear. Another thing they do is play around with words and rather rhythmically um, and little rhythmic melodic motives. And um, you, that kind of play, you may call that more word play than, than music play. And then the chanting, which is kind of on the more typical sort of singing that one often hears, da, da, dee, da, kind of calling out to one another. And that's often associated with more sociable play with, with other children, out, out of doors maybe, when they're playing on equipment or something like that. And then movement vocalizations. Um, this is when they're, they're moving and they often make vocalizations to, to accompany what they're doing. So they'll and they're often making movement patterns and using their voices. And again, you may just think, well, they're, they're using their voices, but it's part of this multimodal activity that children are always engaged in. So could you call it singing? Can you call it movement? Could you call it? It's usually all these different dimensions and modes of activity in combination. So what kind of, excuse me, I just want to take a drink. So what kind of pedagogical expertise do you need? Uh, so as you saw with Alison, she, provide, she provided a conducive environment. So the environment, the early childhood setting, needs to be a kind of singing rich environment where there's lots of songs going on, there's lots of takes of songs, there's lots of, of adults who sing, quite comfortably and, and readily, and then props to prompt singing play, things like the singing tent and so on. Different ways to kind of in, invite spontaneous singing, to invite improvised singing on the part of the children. I think it's important just to ask for a made-up song. There's often a kind of reticence to do that because people believe that children 
won't or can't make up a song. But if you ask for a song, the children will sing you a song. They, make up, well, they will make up a song. Um, or it could be that you ask for some singing to go with uh, an activity or some kind of play with an object. It is, of course, important to listen for and notice singing play. It's really important to, to, to hear it going on, to acknowledge it, um, and to listen musically, to listen really carefully, and comment if appropriate. I mean, you don't want to zoom in and kind of close it down by being over, uh, by, by, by saying too much too soon. But it's important to, to comment if appropriate. And sometimes I think it's, it's right to join in with the singing or to say, I, I heard you singing if, because I have to concentrate really hard. Um, so, if you could, so when children are, are singing, if you sometimes join in and respond um, and join in with them, if, if it, again, if it seems appropriate, without kind of closing down what they're doing. Um, I think that it's really useful to provide easy recording and replay equipment, the little kind of tin lid things I was telling you about, or, or iPhones, or these microphones, you know, even the toy microphones that you can get. Um, and then share the audio files. You know, I don't know how you keep your assessments, but in, um, in the UK, people are always running around with loads of post-its and, you know, very thoughtful kinds of assessments of children. Do you ever share assessments of recordings of children singing or recordings of children making music? Uh, you may take drawings to your assessment meetings, you may take drawings to meetings with parents, but do you take songs, do you take music? It's worth thinking about. So, and here's the tricky question. This is always the, the kind of million dollar, really tricky question. And I don't have, and I'm not going to answer it, and I don't have answers for it. I'm just going to leave these questions hanging in the air. So to what extent is everyday musicality, the kind of musicality that everyone possesses just by virtue of being a human being, um, to what extent is everyday musicality enough? And to what extent do we require specialist music skills to do music effectively in the early childhood curriculum? That's a really huge and controversial question and I should just leave it hanging in the air for you to think about. You can and should music content knowledge, skills and knowledge of children's musical behaviour development be expected as part of generalist practice. Um, so, I um, should music content knowledge and skills um, be part of, expected as part of generalist practice? I think we should. I think training to be an early childhood practitioner should include quite a lot of information about how children make music, about their, their different types of spontaneous singing and so on. So, uh, here we have the usual practice then. Um, the usual practice is group activity and then very often child-led, with the individual activity exploring, the adult leaves, the children well alone, and the children explore. In the UK, certainly that's usual practice with a kind of music area set up. And um, so, but I think really what we're looking for is a kind of spectrum. I often describe things as this kind of spectrum. So on the, at the one end of the spectrum, you have adult-led activity when the children imitate the adults in the form. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have that kind of activity. Often when people hear me talk about spontaneous music and children making their own music, they think that I'm saying you shouldn't do any formal music work at all. I'm all for children sitting in a circle and being told, you know, listen to me really carefully. I'm going to sing a song for you to listen to. That, that, that we are going to learn to sing really well. Um, so adult-led activity. And at the other end is the child-led, which is often just happens by itself and, and is rarely observed or noticed. It's, it's just not, not, not part, you just don't have to be there. I mean, children are playing all over the place in the setting. You can't notice everything. Um, but in between that spectrum is this middle area where the child and adult are interacting and responsive with one another both in vocal, in instrumental, and movement play. And that, of course, is the whole um, responsive practice, Vygotskyan-based responsive practice in which there's interaction between adults and children. And that's the kind of music play that I'm particularly interested in. So what's he doing? He's obviously exploring those bells. And 
He's finding out how to control them. He's trying hard to control them in some kind of way. He's listening and watching. He's recognizing changes of pitch, and he's matching uh, both. Uh, he's recognizing the match with Trish, and he's also matching what Trish does. What does Trish do? She's provided uh, appropriate resources. I mean, she, she decided she would work with things that, that, that had these kind of limitations, in a way, to, 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 to engender this kind of play and to focus the children in on listening, because the thing that the bells do is really make you listen. She's ready to play. She's sitting there on the floor, you know, like, um, like Alison. She's, she's ready to be a play partner. She listens and watches and responds wordlessly. And her timing is really, you know, he goes bing, and then she goes bing in just the sort of right moment somehow. So her timing is very good, and she has the right kind of dynamic. She mostly copies the little boy, although it, you may think it's the other way around, but she's mostly copying. And then she judges very carefully the moment at which to introduce something new. So here's this point that I make, that different instruments, when we're doing music work, one of the challenges is that all those instruments that you have um, engender different types of play. And the constraints and possibilities vary in structure play and learning in different directions. And uh, you, you, know, you need to look carefully at what the play potential of different instruments is. I mean, that's just what's going through her head. She's thinking about, they were thinking about shoes because they had to take their shoes off. So that's why they were so singing, no shoes, no shoes. And we have got no shoes. Now, that's interesting, that play, I think, um, because you had two children. So it's a much more complicated play, um, but it's still, they're still playing with musical ideas very expressively and imaginatively, I think you would agree. Um, they're playing rhythmically, both with words, with song fragments, with singing, and they're playing with rhythm through the body movement. And the great thing, the reason I like xylophones, especially if you give two beaters, don't ever just give children one beat, please, but two beaters, because then they can play with both sides of the body. Um, so they're playing with the xylophones with the two beaters, and it's really a kind of sounding out of body movement. Of course, the pitch doesn't uh, correspond to body movement more than corresponding to a kind of recognized tune. Um, and you can see how the children are playing in this very multimodal way. It's a mix of singing and body movement and, and sound from the instrument. And they're playing with phrasing and with turn-taking and with simple structures. In, in that particular exchange, in that particular episode, um, Nancy's doing much more. She's introducing more than, than the rather simpler kind of play from Trish before. So she's listening and observing. She's taking up their ideas. She's copying, but she's extending them and adding to them much more. So she's being a much more um, engaging partner. She's doing much more in that, that play than... than um, the one before. But she does allow the initiative to remain with the children. She, she doesn't take over in any kind of way. And that's the really hard thing and the really crucial thing is not to take, o take over. And this kind of thinking, um, the EPI project, which is called the Effective, um, Effective Practice in Preschool Education Project from London University, uh, came up with the idea of sustained shared thinking as being the ideal to achieve between um, adults and children. And so I think there with Nancy, what we see is sustained shared musical thinking, this kind of for that particular phase. And that's really based on the principle that music is something that's made between people. Music arises from the interactions between people. It, it arises from the, the playful interactions between the adults and the children. So now I'm gonna shift here completely. Uh, I've covered musical play in that little bit and then left myself just 10 minutes to, to, to change gear and change topic. Because as I said to you, really my recent work um, in the lecturing in childhood studies um, has been to think about future musical childhoods and the challenges ahead. But I'd just like to go through these uh, quite quickly and change to this topic. Um, uh, as long as you're not too tired. And, all right. Okay, so childhood studies, the principle behind, the principal theoretical idea behind childhood studies is that childhood is socially constructed, very straightforward. And so therefore, from that idea, we take the, the idea that, that, that musical childhoods are also socially constructed. That our understandings of what children are from different cultures, 
from different, uh, di different contexts are different. So the, the musical child in the eyes, say, of somebody who's producing popular culture for young children will be very different from the musical childhood of a parent or the musical childhoods through the eyes of a child themselves or the musical childhoods of, say, an educator and so on and so on. So we think about musical childhood as being different, differently framed in different contexts and that the values and aims of those people within those different contexts vary. And that children have to negotiate these different musical childhoods uh, in, in their own way. And so the, uh, uh, an interest in musical childhoods tends to focus your interest on the everyday experiences of children as musical, outside of educational contexts, and we've been mostly looking at the home. But that's really important because then that tells us what children are doing at home, which then has implications for what you would do in, in the early childhood setting. And I've been really talking about what I see as what I call the three Ds, the, the future musical, future musical childhoods, the new challenges, which are digital di technologies, diversity or diversities, and disparity. And uh, digital technologies. Um, so new technologies, really, even in you know just the last five, ten years, ha have dramatically changed the nature of music and musical experience for young children. I mean, profoundly. If you think of ubiquitous mobile handheld technologies of which we've got innumerable examples in this room being used at the moment, um, uh, how ubiquitous those are. And they're ubiquitous in the, in the world for young children. What's the first thing that a baby plays with, huh? What is the first thing that a baby plays with really serious? It's mother's mobile phone, because the mother gives the, the baby the mobile phone when it wants to keep it occupied in the supermarket queue or waiting for the bus or whatever. And they know how to do it, don't they? They know how to get the, how to, and they go like this on, on everything they find on the television. Uh, so they, to try and get it to, they understand how technology works and, and what its functions are. And music is embedded in all these kinds of big technology things. Think of, just think of the musical toys around babies and small children now. Uh, cot mobiles and toy, all, toys with all these melodies embedded kind of video games and all the films and TV programs, it would be very interesting to think how much music and what kind of music uh, today's babies and, very, and toddlers and small children are hearing in the course of an everyday life. Um, not, so it's just changed dramatically the nature of musical childhoods. Um, and it needs, I think, to change the, the nature of music practice. It does need incorporating music technologies into practice, I think is a, a way forward in which you can expand and enrich practice. Um, it is actually also profoundly changing the nature of music. Um, I don't know too much about all the iPads apps for Compose and Create, so I sent a quick email to Ollie Armstrong, who has done his MA research on using iPads in early childhood music education. So this is his reply. So I said, quick, tell me what apps you use, Ollie, for, um, on the iPad or iPhone. And this is the whole list uh, of what he said. So he's been researching how to use all these different kinds of apps. And uh, his master's thesis is readily available on the web. Um, diversity. So in the UK, we have increased movement of populations. We have uh, a very diverse uh, immigrants' populations and increasingly diverse, as you may have seen from the news. Um, here in New Zealand, you have heritage cultures. And catering for diversity, as you know, and we always look to New Zealand for an example of bicultural curriculum, it's much more profound than including songs from different parts of the world. And it's recognizing varying constructions of musical childhoods, different conceptions of what it means to be musical within different cultures, and so on. And this is the very last uh, slide. And what concerns me most at the moment, and I really don't have anything more to say about this, is the increasing gap between the rich and the poor. I mean, the political situation in the UK is such that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, and that's a situation worldwide. And we have more than one in three children in the UK living in, in poverty. Um, and rich children tend to um, be uh, brought up in what's known as, what's been described as intensive parenting, where there's a great intensity small children, just one or two children, small families rather, one or two children in the family, a lot of intensive input into those children, 
uh, lots of after school clubs and lots of uh, enrichment activities. Um, and somebody in the States calls it concerted cultivation, Laro. Um, so there's this, you get one, children, middle class children subject to this kind of intensive parenting, and children living in poverty who, who miss out. Um, and education really should, has responsibility to even up opp uh, opportunities. And it has been shown that quality early childhood education um, can help to even up uh, missed opportunities that are the consequence of, of impoverished circumstances. Um, but at the same time, it's important not to impose middle class parenting values. And as I said, that's my last D of the three challenges. And I really don't have any answers to this one until the government puts more money into funding quality early childhood education in the UK. And that's it, folks. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for listening.